Our session titled Related Party Transgressions Within Harm's Length. Even though uh, regulatory responses to conflicts of interest are reportedly in place, related party transgressions flourish in the corporate world and audit committees approve them in the ordinary course of business. So is it time for shareholders to up the ante? To discuss this elaborately, we have with us Mr. Y.H. Malegam, the former and longest serving member of the Central Board of Reserve Bank of India, Chairman Emeritus of SB Billimoria and Company, former Chairman of the National Advisory Committee on Accounting Standards, former President Ikai, uh, Pres Chairman of the Malegam Committee on the MFI Sector, member FSLRC, in fact, the list is endless, so I will stop with just the mention of these. The country's foremost financial expert, he is really the go-to person for regulators, among others. We also have with us Mr. Kiran Karnik, former president of NASCOM, widely recognized as a thought leader and guiding force for the Indian IT industry and for promoting Brand India, especially by showcasing India's technological strength uh, to the world. Prior to joining NASCOM, he was MD and CEO of Discovery Networks in India, where he spearheaded the launch of Discovery Channel in South Asia and Animal Planet. And earlier, Mr. Karnik worked for over 20 years at ISRO, where he held various positions. Currently, he's also serving as a director in the Central Board of Directors of the Reserve Bank of India, and Mr. Karnik has most kindly agreed to moderate this session. Mr. Sanjay Nair is the member and CEO of KKR India and of KKR's Asian Investment Committee and Asia Portfolio Management Committee. He serves on the boards of directors of a number of companies, including portfolio companies of KKR and on the governing boards of educational institutions. Mr. Nair has been the CEO of Citigroup's Indian and South Asian operations and was a member of Citigroup's Management Committee and the Asia Executive Operating Committee. So it's over to you, Mr. Karnik. Mr. Damodre. Sorry, before, you, before they get started, I wanted to make one comment. Uh, and that is that, you know all these three gentlemen, they don't need an introduction and what you need to know, she's already read out to you. But let me tell you this. Kiran Karnik was in northeastern India yesterday. F tried to reach here yesterday at a reasonable hour, but the aircraft landed somewhere else. Nevertheless, he made it, and I have it on good authority that around midnight, he checked into the hotel because he wanted to be here for this conference. Sanjay flew in from Delhi last night, and uh, it's been difficult getting Sanjay, I must say that, but then, <laughs> he, but, but then he committed uh, that he would be here, and here he is, but uh, this conference, will never ever be complete without Mr. Malega. And my biggest shock was when I got a message saying that he has chest congestion, he has a bad throat and difficulty in speaking. And there was in my mind, not in his mind, a question mark on whether he would make it. But Mr. Malega is Mr. Malega. And uh, this conference will never ever be complete without him. I thought I'll set the context in which these three gentlemen are here because it's people like this that give us the energy and the, the fuel to drive these conferences. Thank you. Thank you, Rini, and thank you, Mr. Damodaran. Good morning to all of you. Uh, special pleasure to be here today in this very august audience and a special word of thanks again to Mr. Damodaran for inviting me here and having me here in such company. It's two very distinguished panelists. Uh, I hope you've not had an overdose of Kiran's. The first one was, I think, just enticing. So another Kiran, if you didn't have enough of one. But not on the same level, much lower quality, <laughs> but we do, we do with what we can. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the sort of way I thought <coughs> we'd structure this is that uh, <coughs> I'll wear the hat. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, wear the hat of a panelist briefly and we had to moderate the session. Uh, but I want to start first with Mr. Malegam. <coughs> uh, 
request your views. Yes, Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. <coughs> you know, the area of uh, related party transactions is, in my view, a very high risk area. It's a high risk for the company uh, because uh, if you look at the company failures which have taken place in the last few years, a majority, if not all of them, have been triggered by a diversion of funds by promoters to related parties, to shell companies, and uh, to dubious uh, entities, all of which are in some way connected with promoters or directors and so on. So it's a high risk for the companies. It's an even higher risk for the directors of those companies. And that is because the, for two reasons. One, the penalties which are formulated in the act are quite draconian in the sense that the punishment could extend to imprisonment, it could extend to fines, it could result in a person being debarred from being a director of a company for five years. And for a more important reason, that the ability of the director to detect a related party transaction is somewhat limited. Uh, he, is, he has to rely to a large extent on declarations which are made by other directors on the mechanism which is there within the company to identify such transactions and so on. So, therefore, I think it's a high risk area. Now, I would like to flag four issues which we would like to consider. The first is, who is a related party? There are, in fact, two definitions of it. There is a definition under the Companies Act which lists out a number of entities and individuals. But surprisingly, whereas it has this whole list of relations and persons and so on, it doesn't list the entities which are controlled by some of these people. So I may be wrong, but my feeling is that if tomorrow the wife of a director had a private limited company, <laughs> under the Companies Act, that would not be a related party. And that is clearly a loophole. But under the listing agreement, the provision is that a related party is a related party is defined under the Companies Act or as specified in the accounting standards. And the accounting standards definition of a related party is much wider. It includes all entities which are controlled or over which you have a substantial interest or an undue or great influence which are and with which the people who are nominated as related parties are involved. So therefore, if you take that definition, you will get a much wider field. Now the question which has to be considered is, what happens if there is an offense by a person or there is a transaction with a related party, which is a related party under the listing agreement, but not a related party under the act? then will the penalties which are applicable under the Act be applicable to such a transaction? Or would they only be the penalties which are there in the listing agreement? I think that's one issue which perhaps uh, needs to be flagged. The second issue is that the Act talks of transactions in the normal course of business. There is no definition of what is a transaction in the normal course of business. And there are different views about it. My own view is that when you talk of a transaction in the normal course of business, it must mean a transaction 
which is part of the normal business of that entity, not a transaction which is incidental to that business. And therefore, if you are, you, because this distinction is important because of the authorities which can sanction such transactions. But it's also important because the risk to the directors increases when there are terms used in the regulations which are capable of alternate meaning. And if there are value judgments involved, and there are value judgments, some, uh, the director honestly takes one value judgment, and the regulator takes a different value judgment, he could have a serious problem. So that was the second issue which I'd like to flag. The third issue is about the, uh, what are the regulatory requirements for the approvals? Under the Act, it is provided that if you have a related party transaction which exceeds the limits which are specified, you need a ordinary approval of the shareholders. And it is also specified that in that voting, the related party cannot participate. Now, there was a view taken that all related parties cannot participate, meaning if you have two related parties and one is only involved in this transaction, the other who has nothing to do with the transaction also could not participate. And therefore, which was illogical, and therefore the Companies Act issue a guidance, I think in 2014, saying it's only that related party which is involved in the transaction who cannot participate. And I thought that was a good thing. But unfortunately, the listing agreement has not made that change. So that today under the listing agreement, all related parties cannot participate in this transaction. Secondly, again, you have a divergence under the Companies Act, it says, that where you have transactions which are in the nature of reconstruction, amalgamation, acquisition, for which there are separate provisions under the Act, the related party transaction provisions do not apply. The listing agreements do not make this sort of distinction. <coughs> and the fourth issue which I'd like to flag is, is that there is a real problem created in respect of companies where the non-promoter holding is very small, take mainly the case of the MNCs. There are many MNCs where the public shareholding is 25%. Now, if you take that position and say you put the resolution to the postal vote of the shareholders, it's very likely that 50% of the minority shareholders will not vote, which this seems to be the pattern. And they probably they don't vote because they have no objection to that transaction. Now therefore, out of 25%, only 12.5% vote. And if 6.3% vote against the transaction, the transaction cannot go through. And in the, of the people who vote, you have mutual funds, you have private equity, etc., which have sizable blocks of the shareholding. So to some extent, the whole deal becomes subject to the whims and fancies of a few shareholders who may have a different view on the matter. So I would have thought the more logical view is to say, that when someone does not vote for a resolution, he shall be deemed to have voted in favor of the resolution. Because if he did not favor it, he would object to it. So you either have that situation and say in calculating the votes, for those who did not vote, you treat it as a positive vote. Or alternatively, that in calculating the votes, the transaction cannot be done if more than 50% of the non-interested shareholders oppose the resolution. 
But unless this is done, this is creating a major issue. I think these are some of the issues which I'd like to flag at the beginning. Thank you very much, Mr. Malgam. As usual, very perceptive, very precise, the four issues. And I think we'll come back to them in a bit of a discussion. Um, sorry, I think my voice is better now. I think not, not here. I seem to have lost my voice. So <laughs> he was fine, as you can see. Uh, just a few comments before requesting Sanjay to speak. You know, we're looking here at transgressions. And as Mr. Malgam just pointed out, a large part of the problems seem to come from these kind of related party things. And we've got to see where and how these are happening and what can stop them, either in terms of legal aspects that are there, the Companies Act, the listing agreements, or in terms of what role the board needs to play to look at these. And I want to come back in a moment to what role the boards can play. But I think the right person to speak a little more about that is Sanjay and to give us a perspective of what is it that from his vantage point, and he sees many, many companies, he sees as the kind of issues, not just in terms of the specific issue of related party transactions, but the broader ambit of what that does to investor confidence and how they perceive this. So Sanjay, over to you to Thank give you. your perspective on this. Thank you, Mr. Damodaran, for inviting again. I think your platform has grown really well, and I just hope that you know the, the culture of governance I just hope there is an increase in it, but from last time when I was here to now, the disturbing trend I think has gone down actually. And obviously it's disturbing because maybe it's a time when there is a lot of stress in the markets and the economy, uh, there is a bankruptcy code, uh, defaulters are not uh, spared. These are all good things by the way. But the behavior and the culture has deteriorated rapidly and we're seeing this affect uh, us in many ways. And by us, I mean the investor community. Today, India's biggest FDI contribution is coming from foreign investors, whether it's venture capital, it's private equity growth, it's private equity buyout. There is some real FDI, but frankly, this five, seven-year money is today playing a very important role in the economy, both in terms of growth and, and in terms of capital creation. And you know, my view is that uh, Sitting in listed companies with minority stake is actually the toughest situation to be in. Uh, where we have buyouts uh, and we sit with the whole company to ourselves, I think things are much easier to manage. So we should really address the first one because that is the majority of the capital, how it comes in, is it comes in in the form of private equity or private credit, either in a company or at a whole co, at the holding company level. And the disturbing trend, I think, is that one thing that what we used to all focus on related party was, you know, agreements, rentals, properties. I think that's all passe. The big thing now is lending and borrowing to other entities. And somehow it gets missed out. And I don't know the section 188 or 185, but frankly, lending and borrowing to companies where the beneficial ownership might translate back to a director or KMP is not captured. And it is being used, you know, again and again and again. And numbers are growing. And as I said, maybe there are stress for different reasons uh, because the environment is quite tough and is hopefully we're going to come out better after all this poison. But the fact is that it is hurting investor confidence big time. Uh, the structures, it's not just about going around the sections, but I think that uh, they're becoming very, very creative also. The banks also actually willy-nilly are not involved, but they're not able to detect what's going on because money is now moving from account A to B to C also to make sure there's a bit of evergreening going on. So it's not necessarily going for personal uh, you know, uh, wealth creation, but it's going into companies. And this is really a very, very troubling fact. Structures are getting into situations where subsidies are getting created. Trusts are getting in the middle. And these are not covered by any of these acts, and you can't detect them. So I think that's a real issue, because when investor money comes in, it is either coming to refinance somebody or is coming in for actual capital expenditure. And we are finding there is quite a massive amount of leakage that's, that's going on. So I think that's really the most disturbing trend right now. And, and I really wonder why. And I think there is a general deterioration of culture. When private investors come in or private credit comes in, there's an element of trust that one comes with. You know, we used to always say, 
once you de define a document, a lot of us don't ever go back to the document. We always do on mutual trust. I think the trust is breaking down, and that's unfortunate because foreign capital beyond the point can never do or expect to do the diligence that you think you can capture everything. A lot of things happen on trust, and you always say you do business with people that you like and trust. You respect them, they respect you. So I think that's one big change that is, that is going on, and I think that's going to, in the long run, make cost of capital higher, make getting money in that much more difficult, and unfortunately, it's not like the local players can do much more because they are anyway more regulated than the foreigners. And they're also hurting, by the way. Mutual funds are hurting, banks are hurting, private NBFCs are hurting. So I think we're seeing, we're staring at an implication of all of this related party transactions, especially as it relates to lending and borrowing to related parties, not captured, not transparent, happening either way below, people are sitting at the top, listed entities, unlisted entities even more so. Uh, and I think my, my, my real submission is that we could see a slowdown in the FDI from this segment. But I also believe on the positive side, as I said, that I think we will come out of this much stronger. Uh, platforms like this, I just hope there isn't regulation to a new level where nothing happens, but there's some degree of self-governance. Now, I don't know what that is, and that is something we should debate. And I was talking to Mr. Maligam earlier, you know, what self-governance can you bring in? You know, can you shame the peers in public? No one does that. Can you create bodies again? <laughs> Self-regulate bodies, I, I think it's not possible. So I would really love to talk about what can we do to get some degree of self-governance back? Because any more regulation, any more forensic diligence is just going to defeat the purpose and slow down what I think is a very valuable form of capital that India needs today. <laughs> Thank you, Sanjay. I think you painted a picture that's disturbing. I want to come back to some of the points and maybe talk a little bit about that. <laughs> Just want to point out one more thing. So we open up this discussion to so a slightly broader plane. You know, one are the financial kinds of transactions between related parties to which both Mr. Madhugam and Sanjay referred to in terms of money and moving down. Sanjay talked of trusts and other forms which are a little more opaque in terms of laws and what you can do there. There's also another form which from the point of view of governance and the boards one needs to look at, which has become a form that's been used in the past but may be becoming more widespread. And that's a form of, you might say, buying influence to related parties. And the examples of this that come out where the promoter, founder, wants something done and uh, the, the indirect method is to get a key person's son, daughter, daughter-in-law, wife on the board. And we talked earlier about board compensations. Board compensation is not terribly high in India, but some of them are reasonably high. And is this a way of a related party in an indirect sense getting affected? And this has more to do with the ethics and integrity. And to a limited extent, cash transfers. And how do you deal with these kinds of issues is something else I think boards will have to grapple with more than the law, but that may be something else we may want to touch on if we have time beyond the immediate related party, formal, legal, and technical aspects. Uh, Sanjay spoke of a very important part, which is also a big theme of the morning discussion, on the trust part of it. And you know, I do want to recall, Sanjay, to what you're saying, that uh, some years back, uh, the CEO of one of the biggest tech companies in the world uh, mentioned to me that he and his company prefer to invest in India compared to China and a few other countries, because the trust level here is higher. And what you're saying is, is certainly disturbing because the trust level, if it erodes, and you're so right because everybody knows this, that sadly, especially in India, the, you, know, you write an agreement, and uh, the only way to handle that if something goes wrong is to go to courts, yeah. which means your children might get some benefit or may not, but you never see that. So given the logjam or judicial system in general, Companies, investors do operate a great deal on trust. You put in an agreement which takes care of all the legal aspects and hope it works, but ultimately it's the trust in that. And I think if that trust is eroding, I think it's a cause for very, very serious concern and what we need to do on that. Uh, the one aspect I do want to touch on, and Mr. Malgram, you touched on this, and like your response to some of this, you know, you pointed out the four major issues that are there and how 
some of them relate to deferring laws in terms of not being harmonized between the listing agreements and the companies act. Now, is there a way of bringing in some degree of harmony to make sure that there are well defined, very clear guidelines and things for related party transactions which will help not just the legal part but help boards to be able to handle and study this thing. Otherwise, boards are a bit caught up, particularly independent directors are looking at related party transactions and the two deferring kinds of things, which one do they go by and especially the two as on occasion and you would be the best one to confirm if this is so, are not a direct conflict but are not quite at par, they don't quite overlap. So how, how do you deal with this? What is the method of going forward in this area? Well, I think first is the, the general proposition. The general proposition is that the Companies Act applies to all companies. The SEBI regulations apply to listed companies. And traditionally, SEBI regulations were supposed to be more stringent uh, because the risks involved to the listed companies were greater, there was a larger public interest involved and so on. So if there is any difference between what the listing regulation says and the Act says, that difference should be restricted to areas where you want to make something more stringent. It should not be a difference on the basic fact itself. You don't define the same term in two different ways. You must have a reason why a SEBI regulation or a listing regulation is different. And you say it's different because you want to make a regulation stricter in so far as that is concerned. There's one other thought which I have. You said, how do we resolve this? I think the general proposition I'd like to make is that any time you have a regulation which is meant to discipline people, it should be specifically directed to the wrongdoer. It should not be cover people who, have, who had nothing to do with it. So therefore, I mean, if you have a regulation which says that if a company breaches the related party transaction, every director of that company is liable, it doesn't make sense. It should be a regulation which says the director who was responsible for that violation should be punished. It is, now, if you extend that further in the area of related party transactions, it means that first you must have knowledge that there is a related party transaction. And the only person who can provide that knowledge is the director who is a related party. No one else can provide that knowledge and you cannot expect someone else to provide that knowledge. So therefore, I think we should restrict it to that direct. The second point is, ask for knowledge which can be within the competence of that individual. If you ask me what my wife is doing in terms of a business, I would be willing to say, yes, I know what business she's doing. If you ask me whether my brother has an interest in some shares, I don't know that. How can you expect me to therefore disclose the fact that my brother has shares in some other company? The regulator doesn't seem to take this factor into account. So that, that is a, a second issue which we need to, to address. I think the question is, on that, Mr. Malgam. Sorry, so just a quick question. I'll sure. come, back, come back to your question. To your point on, on this, which is a valid thing. Yeah. You know, every time I fill these forms, I have the same yeah. kinds of problems. How do I know yeah. of somebody, a brother yes. who's sitting in the US for the last 30 years or a sister who's there for 40 years, what shares they might own in yeah. India and declare them and related parties and other things. <coughs> How do these regulations come about? You've got regulators who are quite sensible and sane. Well, we have a brilliant example right here. So where do these come from and what happens? Kiran, it's there in the Companies Act. In the Companies Act, every director is required to disclose particulars about members of his relation. I know, but where does this idea come and, from? And, and when I have to disclose, I say that I don't know. How can I disclose facts which are not within my knowledge and which I cannot compel someone to disclose to me? So this is the first point that you are, the regulator has to take a 
a practical view of the matter. That's the whole point. We come back to regulators. Sanjay, sorry, you had no, a question. No, I was just, I was just picking up on the point of trust because I left a vague word called trust out there. But this is exactly the kind of stuff that you trust when you put money that they will disclose the person who is in know of if my brother's wife is holding certain shares. If you don't know, you don't know, and you discover it two, three days, uh, two, three years later. That is the point I meant by trust. You know how transparent are people because you depend a lot upon what what people tell you. So that's that's I was just adding to the point of trust. Yeah. That's, that's that's quite a point. But you know, in your experience, Sanjay, is this a method that's really disturbing in terms of the related party transactions, specifically in terms of money going in and then finding its way elsewhere? Is that something you've actually seen? No, I, look, I mean, as I said, that trend is increasing, uh, and I think we, as I said, we were traditionally all focused on. Uh, commercial agreements and commercial arrangements and trying to put that in the public uh, and putting that on the litmus test. Is it arm's length? Is it this? Is it that? But this whole borrowing and lending to related party vehicles has just become a new and a very big uh, area. Uh, and I think we've always talked about, you know, what happened eight, ten years ago with, you know, with, with, with the healthcare business of, of a famous group. But I think what that started as a trend and what's going on is that has become kind of the new trend we are, we are, we are finding. So I think borrowing and lending is something that <clears throat> we will have to look at very carefully going forward. And if it's happening in subsidiaries or it's happening in entities and they're not captured under the RPT, I think you can miss it completely. There's a lot of leakage that can happen through that mechanism. Yeah, but as far as the lending institutions are concerned. No, lending and borrowing to related parties related from parties. your company. No, but what I'm trying to say, when you're lending and borrowing to related parties, are you talking of financial institutions? No. Which are lending to those entities? No, no. 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 The company. Your company in which company. you are invested okay. has got subsidiaries and no. you're lending and no, borrowing because, from because those. because what happens is that in all, in many of these cases where failures have taken place. The, the people holding the way be have ultimately been the financial institutions. Sure, because if the cash is and gone. the financial institutions have not been aware of the fact mm. that there has been a diversion of funds mm. to mm. related parties. And forgive my saying so, but I think perhaps one of the problems is that financial institutions have not built up sufficient market intelligence units. Mm. They do not have within themselves specific units which, which go out into the market, collect market gossip, because many of these things are known to outsiders. Yeah. That is one. But as a general proposition, I think there's one other thing which you wish we should consider. If you just have uh, provisions which says you will obtain approvals, etc., then you have problems in terms of implementing them. If you have provisions which says you give disclosures, yes. and the way in which disclosures are given today, if you see the annual accounts, you will get a schedule where they will say X amount of money led, uh, in terms of, of transactions given to various entities. That is not the answer. I think the answer is that you have limited disclosure mm -hmm. of material related party transactions. And if that disclosure is made available, mm. if there is, you know, sunlight is the, the best yeah, cure for good. many evils. Yes. And if somehow we have more of uh, pointed material disclosures and less of general uh, disclosures, then by itself uh, the fear of disclosure would be a, a good deterrent to this sort of transaction. But, but to this, Mr. Malga, I mean, your earlier point about the, best, the person who knows best is the person who does that, the director or whoever. Yeah. What's the role of auditors in this? Do they have something which they can do well, or should as do? I said, the, the auditors are perhaps in the same position as any other director. They couldn't. Uh, the auditors will rely upon a declaration made by a director that there is a related party. They will rely upon the minutes of the audit committee which says mm. that these are the related party transactions mm. which has been seen by that. And then they will apply their mind to see whether those are on arm's length basis. Yes. The, uh, the 
primary responsibility for disclosure is on the person who is involved. No, that, that's correct. But yeah, if there then, are last transactions. And then I think, but the only thing the directors can do hmm. is to perhaps see that the company has a robust method huh. by which it, it tracks all that's, related party transactions, brings it to both the audit committee. Yes and sees that the audit committee applies its mind to it. That was precisely my question. Can the auditor play that role? If that robust procedure should be there, yeah. he can only see that that procedure, that system <coughs> is, is legislated. That's mm -hmm. how it but I think just the, way, just the way you said that the banks and financial institutions should really up the game in terms of being smarter, I agree with you fully. <coughs> they have to, in fact, in the opening remarks I said that Banks have also been sort of not sleeping at the wheel, but not been as attentive to what's going on. I think the auditors also need to up the technical game as to how to look at <clears throat> the quarter ends and the year ends and, and, you know, movements of cash. I think it's very, very critical. You just can't take everything on the basis of a, a certificate or whatever. So I think everybody has to up the game. But all that I'm saying is that with everybody upping the game, it, and if you're losing trust and you don't have adequate disclosures, it's going to become that much more difficult to get capital. Sanjay, to this, you know, in the morning we discussed a little bit about technology. Are you seeing this actually being used in terms of technology being used to understand some of these data analytics, for example, to understand some of the transactions? Are they using it to throw up these kinds of related party transactions in some way in any companies actually on the ground? I mean, in theory, you can talk about it. Are you actually seeing something happening? No, we haven't seen much of that. I mean, we probably will start thinking about that, but we haven't done much of that. We haven't seen much. Maybe in companies that have very diversified operations or multiple bank accounts uh, or a lot of B2C transactions, maybe they're doing that. Uh, in our experience, we haven't done. But I think you will have to start using technology to a much greater extent. You'll have to have much more integration with the banks, where the accounts are. So I think a lot of that will begin to happen now. Are you seeing that, Mr. Malgam? Are the auditors much more aggressive in using technology for determining some of these things to just throw up red flags? Yes, I think auditors are now using much more of technology because, but where they're using the technology is that in the past, in the absence of technology, <coughs> you had a mass of transactions. Mm. You did a test check of some yeah, transactions for the purpose of determining whether rules were being followed, etc., and so on, whether this is internal controls were operating. Now technology like data analytics, mm. permits you to look at the whole gamut of transactions. So virtually with that technology, now you are not doing a test check. You're looking at the total database. And from that database, using this data analytics, mm. blockchain, and various other techniques, you are able to identify those transactions which need a more detailed scrutiny. Yes. But the starting point, of course, is that the database itself does not contain that document or no, that information. I think, then you're, uh, no, I think that's a fair point. But I think the, the larger issue is that if you can't trust a balance sheet, okay, and balance sheet is at a point in time, I agree data analytics can help if you're looking at a continuum of data or a continuum of series, time series of data. Hmm. But because balance sheets are at a point in time, and if you can't trust the balance sheet numbers, I think it's a different kind of problem. No. Well, I wouldn't say you can't trust no, you them. You can trust them. I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, would not no, I'm saying if, 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 <laughs> if the balance sheet was a point in time, <laughs> okay, you've got to make sure that those numbers are, okay. are perfect. That's the point. No, but to your point, Sanjay, Mr. Mahavigam also said this, you know, I think much of what technology is being used for today, and hope I'm wrong by auditors, and auditors here may take offense, is really automation of existing processes. That's right. It's not really getting, I mean, to what you're saying, and Mr. Malgam said, what is disclosed to them, but the fact is the auditor can look at every transaction, can in theory, I know it's impossible, but with data analytics and they automation, can look at yeah. they can look at every transaction. So why is it that, you know, nobody else needs to tell them if there are ways of doing this, again, I say in theory, but it is not impossible for technology to be able to throw up related party transactions. No, Kiran, the point I'm making is you can look at a transaction. Yes. You can see whether the transaction makes sense. It's yes. in the normal course of business. But you will not be able to find out parties. that that transaction it's is with a related party unless that related party has disclosed the fact that it's a related party. That is the whole problem which is faced. Other numbers. Yeah. <laughs> so, just joking. 
I think, I think that, that's a point. Uh, at this point, I want to throw the floor open and we may come back to a discussion yeah. on the panel itself. So questions, comments on what you heard and maybe anybody has experiences of related party transactions, most welcome to see what are the kinds of issues that really come up on the ground in reality. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh. Sir, each time, each year, audit committees are faced with new, new challenges. Last year, last two years when we've been discussing, it has been underestimation of uh, expenses, liabilities, or impairment of investments and assets. Now it is round tripping of loans, evergreening of loans, and uh, to that extent, today we are talking about comfort letter being given to the bank, not treated as a guarantee, but the same comfort letter being given with a check. What is it? Isn't it a guarantee? And regulators are also trying to say, if audit committee has all the expertise, should they be reactive or learning from the auditors, or should they be actually guiding them in a different way? So really, in a dilemma as to, to what extent can audit committees really be more careful in this? Uh, but uh, so if I have to rephrase, uh, can they somehow sniff potential crisis much more earlier in advance? How proactive can the audit committee be in terms of identifying a crisis in advance? Is that right? Is that sort of question you're asking? Uh, of course, the primary responsibility is with the audit committee. Now, if you are the first problem which arises is that the matter must come before to the attention of the audit committee. Yeah. So you have to have some system within the organization which is robust enough that all of these type of transactions are brought to the attention of the system. One of the problems, as you know, everywhere is that however robust a system you have, it can always be overridden. The most difficult frauds to find are those where management is involved. And therefore, if, if in this case, if the management maneuvers that this information doesn't come to the audit committee, there's nothing that the audit committee would be able to do. So I would say that the obligation of the audit committee is first to examine the internal system to see, are there sufficient checks and balances to ensure that this information will come to the audit committee. And when it comes to the audit committee, of course, they have the complete responsibility to see whether that transaction is at on an arm's length basis. Now, quite frankly, that's an obligation which is there, irrespective of whether the transaction is with a related party or with a non-related party. So that would be the way to do it. Yes, please. Sir, question here. Oh, yes, sorry, please. <laughs> sorry. My name is Dipti Neel uh, One observation having been on the management side in a company, that uh, uh, the comfort about <clears throat> the data being shared for audit purpose itself, whether mm -hmm. statutory or internal, is uh, uh, whether the company is willing, the management is willing to let auditors, internal auditors have access to their system in a limited manner on a C. Only yes. C basis, not analysis, <coughs> no, only for analysis. Um, so that probably gives first level of comfort that management is trying not to hide anything. The second thing is a, a new uh, animal, which is not a related party, but a related party's transaction. So there are promoters who have assets, uh, controlling stake in companies or large stake in companies. Arguably, it is their own asset. They can do what they like, but the loan against shares allows them to raise money and invest in other businesses. If something goes wrong there, it causes this company to have trouble. And we've seen many cases recently. Do we see anything happening in that area, including maybe a new set of regulations, which we all really fear? Just comments from the panel. You know, the point which you make about loans against shares, mm. I think it's an interesting point. If you go back some years ago, uh, there was also, there's always been the situation that a promoter pledges his shares yes. 
and takes Take money. money. And obviously, that money is not taken always for investment in that company. It may be for investment in other companies, which also carry some amount of risk. And you have found these situations that where uh, promoters who, who want to grow too fast, in effect, uh, use the shareholding in one company to raise funds and then another invest company. in other companies and so on. Now, till some years ago, there was n never any disclosure made. And it, no. I remember I was myself the chairman of SEBI's uh, committee on disclosure on when we mandated that every company should disclose this number of shares pledged by the promoters. Now, I think that is the sort of thing which I'm talking about. When that disclosure is made, then you know that this promoter has borrowed money from a bank in order to use that money for some other purposes. Mm. And if as the volume of those shares or the percentage of shares pledged increases, uh, you know that the risk attached to that particular promoter also increases. Mm. So that is the way in which I think one should proceed. Let us have more meaningful disclosures. And then on the basis of those disclosures, mm. you are put on guard in order then you make further inquiries to find that out. Thank you. Sanjay, have you seen problems of this kind? Uh, where absolutely. She made a very valid point that people are pledging shares of their company to put money in other businesses. And in a way, you are probably, you know, hurting this company, this company. because uh, it's coming under pressure. So today you're seeing a lot of stocks where by the disclosure, the pledge levels are high. The company, a well-performing company is getting affected in the, in the market price. Good question. Yes. So this is regarding uh, transactions between a uh, company and its wholly owned subsidiary. What happens is in transactions where, these are, where there is a, let's say, a strategic rationale of a subsidiary supplying to the parent or vice versa, um, there is no intent to go outside of that subsidiary or parent to uh, look for services. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a business model. Now the related party transactions ask for arm's length testing yeah. and now some relaxation has come for wholly owned subsidiaries but the point is in all these cases it's very difficult to go out in the market and obtain a, a quotation or a, a benchmark because competitors know that anyway you're going to be dealing with your subsidiary so nobody is going to quote uh, to make a genuine comparison so a lot of paperwork is being done only to kind of uh, meet the requirements on paper but it's never not in spirit so I wonder why such a thing should be there as long as that's the business model. Because in both cases, the ultimate stakeholder is the parent who is willing to take any losses uh, in case the margins on that transaction come down because it's, it's ultimately a wholly owned subsidiary. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that that requirement is quite frivolous uh, of having to put on paper that, okay, I've compared it with benchmark and that's how the transaction is being done. Mm, I don't know. What do you think, Mr. Malgam? He says that this arms end thing is sometimes a bit, as he says, frivolous. First, you know, first point is the related party transactions requirements do not apply to transactions between the, the parent, parent and, the subsidiary. and the subsidiary. Correct. So I don't see what. No, is but important. where it's not a subsidiary. Sir, it does apply, sir. Wholly owned subsidiary. Wholly owned. If it's a subsidiary, it applies. If it's not wholly owned, is this question. Yeah. It may not be a wholly owned subsidiary, then what happens? Okay. Then is this requirement necessary? Is no. the, question. the point is that if it is a wholly, not a wholly owned subsidiary, then there is someone other than the parent, parent who is involved. So, so why, should, why should it not, why should it be not be at an, on an arm's length. So the, uh, the logic here is that <clears throat> let's say you have 74% stake and yeah. uh, you know the, that's the business model agreed with that 24% partner, 26% partner. So the partner has got no objection. But as a regular business, we have to keep on uh, proving the arm's length test. No, I appreciate the, all I, all I really 
uh, the distinction I'd make is like this. If you have a wholly owned subsidiary, it's nothing else but a department of the same company. Yes. Yes. Therefore, there are no risks Perfect. involved in any transaction which you yes. do. So, yes. immediately, uh, if it's a non wholly owned subsidiary, then there is an outside interest involved. And there is no reason why such a transaction should be at, uh, should not be on an arm's length basis. Um, I'll make one more time, sir. The way I'm uh, trying to position it is, uh, the reason why the, it should not be subjected to an arm's length test is that it is a, a regular business, day in and day out, happening repeatedly as a business model and there is no intent to look outside uh, that subsidiary to deal with <coughs> on that transaction. So therefore, it is a regular business and for every transaction therefore, you can't have an outside test because nobody else, let's say a competition, let's say a benchmark uh, or a, of a similar supplier won't be willing to even quote to give you a market benchmark. And then you have to depend on some studies made by independent experts to give you certain margin as an indicator, but very often the business doesn't earn even that much because it is an average of a whole lot of market participants. I think one of the issues, I think one of the issues could be, and I'm not sure if my answer is right, is that if you're trying to transfer value from the main company yes. to the subsidiary, that's one reason why you need the arm's length right. check because uh, it is possible that someone's trying to create value somewhere else which is not fair to the shareholders of the parent company. And the 26% shareholder you got downstairs, you know, may not be a related party, but may be an interested party mm. who may have given you a certain valuation. And there is a common interest to create less value here or more value here. I'm just using my yes, devious yes. brain. I'm sorry about this. But the only reason it gets subject to this is because you have shareholders at the top. The trust you have 74%, but the 26% guy may be an interested party, not related, and together you're transferring value up or down through underpricing or overpricing. Mr. Damodaran, I think you want to comment on this also. I think it's a safeguard basically, but Mr. Damodaran can tell us. Oops. That's the only reason I can think of. No? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> no, I think it's fairly clear that if it's a wholly owned subsidiary, mm -hmm. since the parent and the subsidiary have the same shareholding pattern, yes. no nobody is going to benefit yes. as a result That's of this right. transaction. Where it is not a wholly owned subsidiary, you must, and I'm entirely with Mr. Malegam on this, you must subject it to the tests of, in the ordinary course of business and at arm's length because the promoter might have a higher shareholding in the pair, in the in this, subsidiary right. the and therefore might do deals which benefit the subsidiary at the expense of the parent and therefore enrich himself. And we know that the history of corporate India, a lot of subsidiaries have been set up Just to do in this. order to unduly Absolutely. and unjustly enrich the persons yes. who are in the parent company. And I've heard it said on good authority that even most of the frauds take place in the subsidiaries, not in the parent company because they're less subject to yeah. scrutiny. So I think it's absolutely necessary. I have, of course, a related point, which is how does the audit committee look at this, given the, the you know, time available to the audit committee for meetings, it's a few hours, mm. you get bunches of paper which says these are the related party transactions. And uh, all that uh, I would like to look at as an audit committee member is, is there a new party that we are dealing with? Is there a transaction which is different from what we have looked at in the past and cleared? Because then I assume it's in the ordinary course of business if a similar transaction with the same set of parties has happened. And as far as the pricing is concerned, I don't think it's very difficult to get other people to quote. I am seeing instances of companies where under the pressure of the audit committee, you are saying create other vendors, non-related party vendors over time, you must reduce your dependence on related party transactions because that is where conflict of interest resides. I'm glad you made this point, Mr. Damodaran, because in my own experience, very limited in bo company boards and audit committees, you get flooded. And I think the board has to set up its own filters to see which are the ones you look at. Otherwise, you get so many of them, it's become an exercise in just saying yes and you know, depending on the management, which is the most dangerous thing you can do in terms of 
your role, particularly an independent director, to safeguard the interests of the company itself. So I think that's something you're absolutely right, needs to be especially looked at and it's difficult. To the point on getting equal in quotes, I think there would be rare instances, I think that's what you may be alluding to, where it's very difficult to get a comparable or a quote of, you know, which makes comparison possible. But those would be unique and few of. I think there must be attempts to try and see what there is. Because this is known, as, as Sanjay said, Mr. Malgam said, Mr. Damsuran repeated, this is a way of very often of siphoning money through the subsidiary where the promoter of the main company has possibly as much or a greater interest in that than in the main company. So it can be a dangerous thing and it's a safeguard which is there. Now there would be some companies for whom this is a bit of a pain, but I think overall it seems a very worthwhile kind of regulation that's there. Uh, more questions? We have a Thank few you. minutes more before we begin to wind up. That's fine. Okay. Yes, Ashok. Can you get a mic here, please? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah. that problem that you said can be solved mm -hmm. by, in this particular JV, there is no real, uh, interest by the key management people. If a blanket statement like that is given, mm. isn't then it is safe to assume that there is no related party transaction in it. So the onus is on related parties to make that mm. MC. Can we not twist it other way that related parties should make a statement rather than company? Mm. Then, then it gets safe because then, it, then they are making a statement. Yes, which is, which which is, is somewhat which similar is, to Mr. Malgam's earlier point saying that you depend on the related party then to discourse. So then the onus is on related party and obviously the wrong statement has its own consequences as we know. So the, will that work is the question. But I suppose in any case for all transactions the company has the responsibility, responsibility. to see that they are on an arm's length basis. Yeah. Whether it's a related party or, or a not a related party. Absolutely. The point is whether uh, the company uh, may not know that the transaction is with a related party unless, unless the related party makes that disclosure. I think what he's, I think what he's saying is he's looking, I think he's talking about self-leadership and self-governance. Let the related party come up and Let say, I'm the related party. I think, well, that would solve all the problems, but that's not the case. <laughs> Ajank, you're right. If we had good would, people in the world, we would need no laws. That's the particular for all the problems. Yeah. I, exactly. But I see what you're saying. Good. Yeah. Uh, okay, Thank I you. think we have, there are no more questions. I want to give a few minutes to both Sanjay and Mr. Malgam to add any other thoughts from this discussion or anything else which you missed out, Sanjay, anything no, else? No, I think just on a, a sort of a bit more positive note, I think. Mm. Yeah, you were very pessimistic, <laughs> I, I noticed. No, I wasn't pessimistic, I was just being a bit more real. But anyway, I think on a more positive note, I think uh, all of this is happening for the good. I really think if the bankruptcy code kicks in the right way, uh, we're learning, everyone's learning a lot of lessons. I think it's going to come out much stronger. And uh, you will probably, I mean, we haven't lost that status of a country in Asia which still has the best corporate governance standard. If you look at the CLSA reports, we're still considered in the top three or four. Uh, so I think we are all too close to a situation, so we are sounding a bit uh, cynical. But I think uh, India, with its growth opportunity, with, you know, hopefully a bit more conviction towards economic reforms, these corporate governance things sort of, you know, get instilled into the companies, into better auditors, better use of technology, better self-governance, investors and financial institutions getting a bit more uh, diligent from the beginning. I think this can be actually a pretty positive outcome because you do need foreign capital. I mean, India itself is bereft of local capital, so you need foreign capital. And I think that th this can be a very interesting time. There are many publications overseas talking about India coming out much stronger from this mm -hmm. rather than weaker. So that's my, that's my closing comment. That's good news. Glad you're ending on an optimistic note. Yeah. Mr. Malgam. No, uh, I, as I said earlier, I think uh, we are placing too much of a responsibility on the audit committee, audit committee and, the, and the board. Maybe there is a certain amount of responsibility which the lenders must take. After all, they have a bigger stake. They have the infrastructure in order to make inquiries, have market research, find out what is happening. And if they take the lead in this, a lot of the abuses which are taking place may not be taking place. You know, I think it seems, just rounding up the discussion, that this related party 
transgressions as Mr. Damodaran has put it very well are a big danger and in fact a lot of the frauds are taking place through that route. Uh, the laws are in place, <coughs> there is some amount of dissonance between what is in the Companies Act which of course covers all companies and the listing agreement in SEBI where these are more limited set of companies but even within that limited set there are some things which are in dissonance. If the SEBI standards were only higher there would not be a problem but there is some degree of dissonance and I think some of them need to be ironed out as Mr. Madhugam has pointed out particularly in terms of definitions and so on. Hopefully it will begin to happen in the course of time. Uh, there is concern though and I think Sanjay has reflected this from investors. He speaks more from the point of view of investors from abroad but I am sure investors from India too are equally concerned about what happens and you know they are putting in money, what is the extent of governance standards that will ensure that it is used for the purposes in which for which the money was invested in the first place and not being siphoned off here and there and I think we need to see how we make raise those standards which is partly to do with related parties but more broadly to do with governance standards, the board, the board's role and audit committee's role. And Mr. Madhukaram just said maybe the audit committee role is being somewhat, uh, how should I put it, the anticipation of what they should do is maybe excessive. Uh, as those of us, many of us here have served on audit committees, you can deal pretty much with what comes to you and ask a few more questions but not very much more. What you can make sure is to, that the processes, the people who are there, the policies are in place. But beyond that, very frankly, the ability to delve into something more is very limited. You are not only dependent on management which can always, as he said again, I have seen this personally happening, irrespective of systems, irrespective of processes, irrespective of the companies, the auditors, the big names doing it, if management is involved it becomes very difficult to prevent a fraud. And you know, I, I hate to say this because it might seem like in some sense saying the management has a free hand in that, no, I think there are controls, there are checks and balances. But it is certainly difficult and to expect the audit committee to play the role of then overseeing and stopping that may be a bit of an excessive expectation. But yet very clearly as we have seen the audit committee role is key. They have to look for things, try and find out things. The auditor's role I would argue has grown, their responsibilities have grown. But I would argue that they need to see how much more they can use other means including particularly technology to try and delve a little more, uh, bring out flags which need to be investigated. They may not be a fraud, they may not be a problem, but identify red flags which the board can look at, the management can look at and I think that role is something that is very critical, particularly in the context of related parties. But as we have discussed very frankly, related party transactions depend a great deal on disclosures by the related parties. Finding out without such disclosures is going to be difficult and disclosures are of course the best way of as has been famously said, repeated by Mr. Madhugam, uh, sunshine is the best disinfectant. So if you can ex disclose, expose, then it becomes very good. I think people can begin to see what can be done there. Uh, we need to make sure that the kind of things that are happening, I've seen a lot of publicity are you know, brought down, not necessarily by laws alone, but by boards being more active, more vigilant, and audit committees playing their own role to see that these are minimized because Investment, as Sanjay pointed out, depends on these kinds of trust factors which depend on the comfort factor saying governance is good and working well in this country. Uh, I do think that both our panelists here and I personally to subscribe to that would end on an optimistic note saying there are problems but it's more to do with more disclosures, more finding out in the sense it's positive. Mr. Madhukaram certainly has said that the lenders have far greater responsibility. I agree with him. They have the wherewithal, they have the tools, they have the people they should be far more proactive than they have been. And if they do that, given that we are seeing much more things coming out, the gov corporate governance standards have been you know, well laid down and improving and I am very optimistic that we will see this moving forward and this whole business of working through related parties to siphon off things will decrease and disappear altogether. That is a dream but we will at least minimize in the future. So with that, let me end this session saying we have been optimistic and we look forward to much better standards in this area and all of you can help in that whole exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you Sanjay. Thank you Mr. Malaga. Thank, Thank you, you very much. May I request Mr. Damodaran to please present tokens of appreciation to all three of our speakers.
ladies and gentlemen, we will not be taking a break, uh, although there is tea and coffee for you outside. Uh, I would encourage you to please remain in the hall because we're going quickly moving into the next session uh, to ensure that we are going to finish on time. So do remain inside the hall. Thank you. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for our fantastic session. <laughs> Families and homilies, a business case, is our next session uh, that features Mr. Janmajaya Sinha, Mr. Krishna Kumar Natarajan, and uh, Mr. Damodaran. So please remain in the hall, ladies and gentlemen, unless you really, really require that cup of coffee. So. Remain, we'll quickly make the changes on the days and move into the next session. <laughs>